thank you so much. Thank you, Russell. I need everyone to just lower your expectations. That was, that was, uh, that was really good. I, I appreciate that. Uh, you know, this, this is an interesting deal because um, Tom called me and said, hey, would you be interested in, in uh, doing, you know, speaking at, at uh, the West Side Dell? And I, I said, oh, wow, okay, sure. And so uh, within 15 minutes, I got an email with my picture on it with Bob Dahl and Archie Dunham and Cliff McDaniel. And I thought, wow, that was fast. <laughs> and it was like, it's like, it like, I felt like, you know how you, uh, you have someone call you, you go, hey, do you want to uh, go to the Ashes game? You go, yeah, when are we going to go? He goes, I, like right now, 30 minutes. We're uh, <laughs> game starting. Can you go? And you go, yeah, because I'm that guy. I'm like, yeah, I'll go. And you hang up and you're going, how many people did he call first? <laughs> it's like, and then, okay, you're in, go. And so, and so when I saw that email, I thought, I, I mean, the first sort of, I mean, I'm, I'm laughing to myself because I'm like looking at the pictures. I'm like going, that, that Sesame song came to mind immediately. One of these things is not like the other. <laughs> One of these, I'm like, what am, it's like Archie Dunham. I mean, it's like, come on, he's a CEO. Like, I'm like, well, you know, I'm gonna come out and, and here's what I bring. Here's what I bring. I'm average. I'm the average guy. And, and I look around this room and I'm thinking, there's a lot of people in here that are better than me. But I also look around and go, there's a lot of guys that are not. <laughs> like, like that table, that table over there, the whole thing. That puts me squarely in the average mode. I mean, it's like, we're just, we're just, I'm average. And here's what's great about that for you. And that is, okay, you go hear Bob Dahl, you go hear Archie Dunham, good chance you're walking out going, you know what, that was awesome, but I could never measure up to that guy. That's not gonna happen today. That is not, there's a good chance you walk out today going, you know what, I'm not that bad. I, I'm okay. So, so let me just tell you this. So we're gonna tell, uh, all, I, all I have is a couple of stories that I'm gonna tell. Uh, and, and, and because, look, I grew up 50 miles south of here. Clute, Texas, went to Brazoswood High School, graduated in 1980. I was talking to my brother the other day, we were talking, because he's got some high school kids, and they're talking about what, uh, what the class rank was. And I go, you know what? I go, I go, Clay, do you know what my class rank was in high school? He goes, no. I go, neither do I. I have no idea. Because I didn't even know it was a thing. That's how average I, it's like, I graduated and I thought, we all got diplomas, right? Everybody's saying, I knew other people took harder classes. I just thought, why would you do that? I, it no, it, at no point did that occur to me. And so I graduated from the University of Texas, but here's what you need to know. I went to four colleges in four years, went to UT for three semesters and got a degree from there. That is finessing the college degree. It's like, <laughs> You, there's no way you can do that today. I mean, it's like I was just there long enough and they gave me a diploma and guess what, I went to UT. So, so there you have it. So that, that's kind of, and, and I tell you all that to prove one thing to you, I am average. That's what I'm proving to you. It's like, did, grew up in Clute, whatever. So, so I met a girl on 7th Street my senior year of college. I fell in love immediately. I'm telling you, I knew that I was going to marry her that I, right when I met her. She took longer to figure that out. <laughs> she, she was like, eh, we'll think about it. But I was, but I was all in. She was uh, Elizabeth Mongiorno, and she uh, was graduating with an accounting degree, and she was gonna go to work for Arthur Anderson in Houston, which meant that I could either move to Houston or get a new girlfriend. Those were my two options. I moved to Houston, had no idea what I was gonna do, didn't know anyone from Houston, didn't know anything about business, Got a job at Eaton Properties during the worst debacle of apartment ownership of all time. It was terrible. I mean, it's like, you have no idea. It's like the Great Depression. It was terrible. What was great about that is that nobody else wanted the job. And that's how I got it. It's like there's, I was telling kids, I would have never been hired in this environment. It's like, you, there's, there's other people. But because nobody else wanted the job, I was hired to sell apartment properties modicum of success, we got, did some other things, bumped along, at no point was it like you're, you're setting the world on fire. 
But you know what? It was a, it was a living, and, and I enjoyed it. I went to Second Baptist Church and got to meet people there and, and kind of you know, settled into Houston. And uh, uh, I think Russell talked about we started Southwest Residential Par- Partners in 96, something like that, 97. And so about along that time is where this story begins. So I'm going to tell you this story because... It, and honestly, I've only told this story a few times because it's very personal, and you'll see. It's a very personal story, but I think it's important to, you know, it's like it is what it is. Let's just tell the story. So my mother-in-law had a house in Kerrville, Texas. If you've ever, if you know Kerrville, you know there's a, that, that lake right there, there's Ingram Lake, and you take the road to hunt from Kerrville. Like if, you, if you have girls that go to camp, if you've ever done that, you, you go by, by there. So, so this story, my oldest son, Carson, was 10 years old. We were having a 10-year-old birthday party. He had 10 of his best friends up there. It's a great time. We're swimming in the, the Guadalupe. It's Sunday morning. We're going to be leaving. Going to go down to the river one more time, go swimming. The boys had already gone down. And if you know, so, so just past the lake, but on the river, the road, the road kind of winds around, and you see... Uh, on the right-hand side is just a kind of a cliff. It's, it's, it's straight up. And then on the left-hand side is the, 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 the river bottom, and there's the Guadalupe. But you have to cross that, that road to hunt. So the house is up here. We come down, and the boys are already going to cross. I grab Davis's hand. I said, hold on. And there's a car. So, so if you can imagine, the river's over there. The hill's behind me. We're, we really only had a, a little bit of room to stand by the road. And so... I said, oh, there's a car coming. Let's wait till the car passes. I grabbed Davis's hand. And as soon as this car passes, my daughter, Kirby, runs out in front. And now, I knew that there was a car coming this way. I thought everybody saw that. But she didn't. She heard me say, let's wait for this car to pass. She darted in front of this car. And this is where it gets weird. And this is where the story kind of breaks down for me. And so that happens. My world slows down, and this is what I saw. Earlier that year, a, one of our dog got out in the middle of the night. I was letting it out to go to the bathroom. <clears throat> Bolts. It's one year old, male boxer, runs. I am running down our street at 2 o'clock in the morning in my underwear, yelling at this dog, Get back here! We get to the end of the street, he runs across, and I see the car coming. It's like, oh gosh. So I stopped, I was real quiet. I can see the dog on this side. I don't say a word. The car's coming. And as soon as the car gets right in front of the dog, it jumps in front of it, kills it. Dog dies right in front of me. It was the police officer for Spring Valley, and he was the canine patrol guy that hit and killed the dog. He, it's like I thought I was going to have to help him. It's like he was devastating. Middle of the night. A dead dog, got to figure this out. I had to go tell my wife. It was awful. I only tell that part is about this. That's what I saw. At that very moment, I saw all that again. It was like a rerun of seeing the dog get hit and die. And at that very moment, I heard a voice and it said, The child is dead. And it was a voice of not this world. It was a voice in my head that I felt like is like just booming. The child is dead. At that moment, I, I snapped back out of it, and I can't see she's not dead, but she has been hit. She's in, she's in the middle of the road. She's been run over. Her, her leg is, has a compound fracture. I bend down. I pick her up, foot dangling. I'm holding it together. I can tell that I'm going into shock. I'm thinking, you've got to hold it together. You've got to hold it together. I'm yelling, call 911. People run up to the deal. Here's, here's some of the, the crazy parts about this story. Two months before that, her pediatrician had retired and moved next door to this house in Kerrville randomly. He usually is at church on Sunday morning, but today he, he decided not to go to church. He happened to be at his house. My wife said, could you come down here? He comes down there. The ambulance shows up. We said, if we can get her morphine, he goes, we can't do that unless there's a doctor. I said, that's, his, that's her doctor. He goes, yes, we can prescribe morphine. He's able to take, you know, help us take care of her. We get to this Kerrville Hospital, 
coming out of surgery at the moment we arrived as an orthopedic surgeon who happened to be there on Sunday morning taking care of a knee for some, for some person. So he immediately, she immediately goes into surgery. And the leg was tough. And he came back out and he said, it's, he goes, listen, let me tell you something. I've never worked harder in my life to get something right. I think I got it right. I had to wash out asphalt out of the bone. And I washed it, and I washed it, and I washed it again, and then I came back and I said, no, we're gonna do it again. We're gonna do it five more times. And he goes, I'm hoping we got it, but I don't know. It would be unlikely that you don't get an infection here, but we, I did my best. She's in, the ho she's in the hospital room. That night, I have to go, my wife stays there at the hospital. I go back to the house. And I'm laying there, but I'm not sleeping. Because I see this movie, this movie, this movie, this movie that goes in front of me, that goes in front of me, goes in front of me. And this is the part that was driving me crazy. There's a car coming this way. There's a car coming this way. And she moves to the, she runs to the middle of the street. The car should have hit her in the middle of her body and blown her out. That's what should have happened. Because I was right there. What happened? What ha how did this happen? How did this happen? On, 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 on. Two days later, the woman who ran over her, or, or she ran into her, called and said, hey, I want to check on your daughter, Kirby. I said, she, you know what? She's going to be great. I think it's going to be fine. We're just very thankful of all the things that happened here. She goes, can I come see her? I need to see her. I said, yeah, absolutely. This woman was a children's minister for the Catholic Church there in Kerrville. And she brought her friend who owns one of the girls' camps there because she goes, I need to tell you a story that's going through my head. I go, okay, come on in. So she says, she looks at Kirby, and Kirby goes, you're the woman I ran into. And she goes, yeah, well, you know, I need to tell you something. She goes, this is what I need to tell you because it's on me, and that is this. When you ran in front of my car, my body, my brain, everything said slam on the brakes, and that's not what happened. The car moved to the left, and then it moved to the right, and it came to a stop. And I don't know how it happened. And I'm, I'm, I'm still bewildered on the entire event. And it was like, wow. It was a wow moment, because it was been, I was like, is this possible? Is this what happened? Did the God, the creator of the universe step in? In the middle of this, I saw all this. Here's another crazy part. My brother-in-law dreamed the night before that he was the one standing next to her and that she jumped in front of the car with him. He jumped out of his bed and knocked over the lamppost. It was so real to him. It was like this ordained moment and suddenly everything changed. She wasn't dead. She was alive. So here's the thing on that moment. That night I go bed, to bed. Once again, I'm not sleeping. I'm looking at the ceiling. And this is what occurred to me. This is what I thought. Look, what would I do right now? What would, I, what would be the negotiation I'd be doing with God? What would I be saying? God, if you save my daughter... Fill in the blank. Every man here knows. You have a daughter. There's nothing that you wouldn't hold back, is there? There's nothing. You say whatever. You want my money? I don't care about money. I want my daughter. God, what do I have to What, what would be the negotiation that you would be willing to do? And as I thought about that, I thought, you know what? Let me tell you something about yourself, Cliff. If you're half the man you think you are, if you have any character whatsoever, you will continue on with that deal because you already got the miracle. You're living on the other side of the miracle. And so I thought to myself, what would I give up? My money? Yes. My life? Yes. My time? Whatever it is. And from that point on, it changed me this way. It's like I thought, okay, I am not... I, 
I live on the other side of the miracle. I will treat my money differently. I'll treat it loosely. My time will be treated loosely. Someone wants to talk to me about the... Uh, yes, I'll be available. Because I look back at that moment, and I always know this. The God of the universe who stepped in and made something different happen. And forever, ever, 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 I'll be grateful. I'll never stop being grateful. So... I love puppies, so I put them up there. If nothing else, you know, those puppies were, those, those, those puppies were cute. So there she is. That's her little broken leg. She went on. You know, there was a question on whether she's going to be able to limp or walk or whatever it was. And she went on to be really a good basketball player. I love this picture of her. That she, she, uh, she went on to be MVP. Uh, she, she started as a freshman at Memorial High School and, Memorial, and she was the most valuable player her sophomore, junior, and senior year. She could play. She did really well. And then this year she got married. Aww. So <laughs> it's an amazing story. It's like everything happened. It's okay. It worked out all right. So the next year, I'm going to get tested on this, okay? Cliff, you made a commitment to yourself. You get many commit. Okay, let's see what you got. So Second Baptist has a fundraiser, get on the bus. And there's a guy in my office, and he said, he was, he was at Second Baptist too, and they gave you these cards. There's like 52 cards or something like that, and you had to go through the cards, and every day you do, Michael, do you remember this? You get on the bus campaign? You go through the cards, you do something, you know, every day it's like, okay, read this scripture, one day you have to fast, you do something else, and it's like, okay, you know, it's like, I'm, I'm all in. And then it comes to the day, you need to decide what you're going to pledge for the Get on the Bus campaign. And so that day I said, okay, this is the day I've done, I've gone through this deal, I'm going to go in my closet, and I'm going to pray, and determine what it is that I'm supposed to give and I did. I went to my closet, and this is what I, this is, this is what I thought. This is what I thought. Is a, it, there's a number that came to my head, and that number was $100,000. It scared me so bad, I left the closet. It's like, okay, let me put this in perspective. I was going to make like $75,000 that year. So it's like, I mean, it's like, that's a, that's a stupid number. And I thought, it's like, that ha it's haunted. I was like, Elizabeth, you're going to get my clothes. I cannot go back in the closet. I'm not going back in the closet. But I felt very, I felt very sure. And so on the Sunday morning when it came up, it's like, you know, you fill out the pledge card, you fill out the amount, you put it in the box. I talked to Elizabeth. She's like, well, that's your problem because you're the one that makes the money. So... Um, <laughs> Good luck. So I do it. I write down that number, put it in the box. And so, it, 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 you know, it's like what I do with sell apartment properties. And so this time, I, I remember it's 2000, 2001, it was not a great year in the business, but I had three deals that were working that I had, you know, that were going along. So Monday morning, after we make this great stand of character, doing what you think is right. And I'm not kidding. I, this is absolutely, positively, 100% true. Starting it from 9.30 to 10.30, I got three calls. And every one of those calls was that deal dying. It's like, yeah, we're not going to be able to do that deal. Yeah, we're not going to be able to. And at 10.30 in the morning, I had no, no deals. Nothing. Nothing. It's like, in my career, I don't remember ever being at a point with nothing. And you know what I thought? Thank you, God. Are you kidding me? It's like, this is, this is, this is how you get paid back? I make a character statement? I'm going to do what, you, what I felt like the prayer. The, uh. So, that year goes clink and clink and clink. Clink, clink, until we get to December. Now, I told you my wife is a CPA, right? Arthur Anderson. 
you'd have to see the accounting that happens in my home. It, we could be a publicly traded corporation. It is <laughs> unbelievable. I mean, it's like there's nothing that she doesn't know about everything. So, which is good news and bad news sometimes, you know what I mean? <laughs> so, she comes to me, I guess it's like December 15th or something, 16th. She said, and, and I had closed some little deal, in, I think it was in Victoria, Texas. It didn't really amount to much. There, was, there wasn't a huge commission there, but the money, some money come in. And she goes, Cliff, I want you to know something. This is December 16th. We sit down. I remember we're sitting on the two stools on the, at the bar. The kids are already asleep. She goes, we're going to be out of money on January 22nd. And she knew. I mean, it's like if she said that, you knew on 23rd we were, like, moving out of the house or something. So it's like she's, like, on it. I go, okay. Um, she goes, and we have this tithe check. From, your, from that commission, well, what do you want me to do? You want me, do you want me to tie this? And I was like, wow. <sighs> and then she laid out, she goes, listen, when we run out of money, this is what it's going to look like. We're going to have to sell the house and move to Katy, sell one of the cars, pull the kids out of private school. Now remember, I mean, she's like, we're going to have to move to Katy uh, and become Catonians. It's like... <laughs> I'm from Clutes, so Katie is still a level up for me. I mean, it's like, <laughs> like ah. the, way, the way you put that didn't sound so bad. Kind of talked me into it. But this is what I said. I said, you know what, honey? This is, I, I don't know even, my dad was a tither, so when we got married, I said, you know, that's what we do. So we were, we were tithers. That's what we did. And it was really easy for me because I just told her to do it, and she would write the checks, and that was it. You know, boom. So... I go, man, yeah, yeah, we're going to tithe. I go, if, I go, look, either God's going to bless us or he's not going to bless us. I don't know. I don't know. But we're going to tithe. We're going we're gonna to do that. And she said, okay. And the next day, she sent the check in. Because that's how she is. You know what happened the next morning in the mailbox? More bills. <laughs> yeah nothing good <laughs> nothing but I will tell you this um, we ground through and guess what we didn't run out of money on January 22nd something happened I don't, know what it, I don't even remember what it was but by the end of that summer enough things had happened and investments had paid off and something else had happened to where I remember at the end of the summer I said Elizabeth we're never you know it's like okay, we're not rich, but we're never going to have to worry about money again. You know, that, that, was, that was kind of the end of that story. That, that's where that kind of wound up. But, I'd never, I, but, I, but I remember this as being tested, because that's the way I saw it. And fortunately, I wasn't tested with a lot of money. It was, like, it, was, it was probably an easy test. I mean, it wasn't easy to test, you know, with what you're looking at, but it wasn't like I had to, you know, make a huge decision. I just said, yeah, we're tithers. That's what we do. That's who we are. And this was my prayer. I said, God, you know what? Afterward, I said, you know what? I, I appreciate that test. And here's what I want you to know. I learned it. I never have to learn that again. That was a one and done, right? That's what I want to, what I want to know. So I'm going to conclude with this because this is, I think it's important. There's some good news and bad news. And the good news is, is that God grades on a curve. And we know that because it says, to whom much is given, much is required. That's the good news. Let me tell you the bad news. The bad news is, you are way up on the curve. <laughs> and here's what you need to know. We talked about this room, and I'm the average person in this room, and all that is true. But the reality is, is that if I'm honest, if I were to look at the internet and see how much money I have and what it takes to be in the 1%, I'm there. It doesn't feel like that. You know why? Because i got a bunch of rich friends, richer than me, which makes me feel middle class, right? Like, what, me? But here's the truth. Here's the absolute truth. I may be average for this room, but this room is not average. This room... If you were to compare it to 
all the people who ever lived on the earth, this room is way above average. If you were to look at just who lives in the world today, this room is way above average, way above average. If you look at this country and who lives in this, the richest country in the world, this room is way above average. If you look at this city and you just look at who lives here in this city, this room is way above average. It is. And that's the truth. And here's what you need to know. You need to know this. There is more good news than bad news. The good news. When you get to heaven, God wants to hear all about your life. I, I kind of imagine it this way. You go off to college, your dad pays for your college, you come back at Christmas break, and he says, hey, tell me about college. Love to hear how it went. Sounds like it should have been amazing. And you go, you know, I didn't go to class that often, and I mostly drank, and met some girls. And your dad goes, really? That's it? Compared to the guy who said, you know what, I joined some clubs, I met some people, loved learning, was did everything that I could find to do that was fun. And your dad goes, I'm so glad to hear how much fun you have. I think that's, that, I think that's what giving account for your life is about. And so the bad news is this, is that, but I tell you that men will give an account on the day of judgment for every careless word they have spoken. This is what you need to know. You are not going to get to go to heaven. You're, and listen, if you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, you can get on your iPhone and start looking at other stuff. This does not account for you. But if, you're a, if, but if you're a believer, if you're a believer, here's what you have to look forward to. This. You have an appointment with God. The only thing that stands between this day and that day is a certain amount of time. That's all. It's just a certain amount of time. And guess what you don't know? How much time that is. We don't know. I mean, statistically, not everyone in this room will be here next year. You know, it's like that's just, the, that's just the hard facts of life. You don't know. But you do know this. It will happen. It will be a moment. And I want you to know this. I want you to know this. Be prepared. Don't go and think you can go into heaven and say, I wasn't, you know, it's like I wasn't that blessed. No, you were. And to whom much is given, much is required. You need to know that today, not later. How to have a meaningful life. So, there's really just a couple of things that I've learned. One is, live a, live a, great, live a life of gratitude. So, if you wake up every morning and think about what you're thankful for, it will change your life. I promise you, it is the one thing that everybody can do, and it will change your life. I have this say, saying, it, gratitude leads to a great attitude. It just does. And if you wake up and you're, you're sourpuss or something else, it, it just ruins you. you. Just one thing, just that one thing is to wake up and be grateful for something. For me, it's easy. I know exactly, every day I have something to be grateful for, because of the story I told you already. Helping other people. Listen, making money is fun, having money is fun, spending money is fun. It's never going to be meaningful. And I'll tell you how you know that. Because when you die, you're not going to care about your money. And I'll tell you why. Because you're not, it's going to go to somebody else. It just is. That's the rule. It goes to somebody else. It's not going to be yours. So how can that, how can that possibly, just think about it. How can that possibly be meaningful when it's just going away? That's, the, that's actually the very definition of not meaningful. It's just going to go away. It cannot have meaning. This is a little, little truth that, that I love, and that is that once you have more money than you're going to spend before you die, from that point on, you're working for somebody else. You just are. I mean, that's just the rule. <laughs> like, and you think you know who it is. You think it's one of your kids. I mean, it may not be. Maybe one of your grandsons, ex-wives, son. You don't know. <laughs> and here's, how, here's the reason why you don't know, because you're dead. It's over. That money's gone, going someplace else. If John D. Rockefeller 
knew what his money was doing, he would be very, I mean, it's like, the, the things that, that, that they do with his money, it's like he would like have quit early. He was like, you know what, I don't need to make any more money because I, I don't like what's going to happen. But helping other people, I'm telling you right now, that's meaningful. Let me tell you a little story. So David Ofke and I go to Honduras with our older, older sons, and we drill a water well. And it was fun, did a great job, was in a, in a school, it was fun, you know, great. Two years later, I go back with Davis, and we drill another water well. But this water well is further down the road into a little village. And here's what happened. We had to drive by the old water well every single day to get to where we're dr drilling the new water well. Every single day that we drove, coming and going, there was somebody at that water well getting water, playing in the water, doing something at the water well. It was clean water. Before that, I knew where they were getting the water. It was in this ditch over here. We completely changed their lives. And the other thing is, I'm standing here, there's someone at that water well, both of them, because it was, it's useful. It was meaningful. Here's the crazy part. That was really great for me. I thought, well, there's something. At least when I'm sleeping, other people are able to still get clean water. There's something. It's helping other people. And here's the thing about that. And if they can't help you, it's even better. Finding, you know, finding people that it's like everybody helps somebody, it's like, okay, now the payback. Yeah, you know, it's like, no. Find the people you can't, you can't, you can't help you back. And that will bring more meaning to your life than anything else. And here's the end of, here's the, end of the story. And that is this. I'm going to have to put this down. I have to yell. My, I, have a, I have a little two-year-old grandson. And, you know, if you say, how old are you? You know, he's like, I'm two. And I always thought that was very cute. You know, they tell you, they can give you the numbers. And it occurred to me, it's like, you know, when you have 10 fingers, I'm going to live 10, you know, your maximum amount of life that you got is 10 decades. That's it. I mean, reality. That's it. 1% get to that clip. So, I'm this old. This is how old I am in that re regard. These are the only thing I got left. And let's be honest, it's probably not the last two. I mean, it's like, okay, maybe, but you can't count on that. So on this spot, I can't do this over again. I can't do that over again. I can concentrate on this and get this right. And maybe this. If, if I'm good, maybe this. But that's it. That's it. And so what I'm telling you is this. No matter how, maybe you're this old, maybe you're the, I, I can see some of their, you know, in the, you know, this old. I see you out there. Hey, listen. You got young kids? Take care of your young kids. Focus on your kids. Focus on your kids. But if you're this old, they're gone. We know that. Some of them right here. Listen, you guys, it's game time. This is it. This is your opportunity to have a meaningful life. I'm not asking you to give. I, all, I want, all I wanted to do is make it better for you. I want to give you opportunities to make it better for you. You're going to stand before God. You are going to stand before God and give an account for your life. What are you going to say up to this point? Hopefully it's a lot of stuff. But let me tell you this. You got two of these left probably. Maybe this. Let's use them. Let's build a resume. Let's talk to people and try to figure out how these two years are the most meaningful. We can build them. We can make it happen. This group is above average. It is above average. This is the group when they say much is given, much is required. Look around the room. God was talking about you. It just is. You're fortunate, you're blessed, all those things. It is what it is. Toolbox was built to help you engage 
in so many different ways. So here's what's going to happen. We're going to send you an email, and it's going to be a follow-up to this. And there's going to be a couple of boxes you can check. I'd like to get involved. I would like to hear more about what I can do. Listen, charm ministries, going into prisons, there's, there's a litany of things that you can do. And let me encourage you this. Check that box, and I'll tell you this. Here's the reality is you could always flake out later. You know what I mean? It's like there's, there's, there's no one that's going to chase you down. We don't have time for that. But, but, you know, start and then figure out later, like, nope, I'm out. Okay, that's fine. But start and just go, maybe I'll, maybe I'll look into it. Maybe I can do something. Maybe I can get involved. Maybe it's a Bible study. There are people out there today that need to hear from you. Your, your experience, the things you've gone through, all those things can be helpful. And that's what we're about. That's all this is. It's a free lunch because we, we don't want to have anyone to feel any pressure whatsoever. We're bringing it to you on a platter so that you can have a meaningful life so that when you stand before God because you know you are, you'll have something to say. That's it. Thank you.